Patients we see who tend to have a flare-up, we like to figure out, is there a reason for it? So you know this. A lot of things can make your symptoms worse and trigger a flare-up, right? So if you get an infection, that can make your myasthenia worse. You start a new medication. Sometimes it makes your myasthenia worse. So which medicines could make you flare up? You guys, anybody ever have a medication that stirred up their disease? What'd you, ha what'd you have? What'd you take? Yeah, plasmapheresis, yeah. So if you start, yeah, if you had eye trouble, and you, or you didn't have any eye trouble, you had breathing trouble, started on cell set, ended up in the hospital, probably the cell set didn't make you worse. Probably, we don't think it does that. But a ton of other medicines do. So if you take antibiotics, almost every antibiotic ever studied has been shown to have some detrimental effect on how the nerve and muscle communicates, almost every one. Uh, and uh, there are some that are bad actors that probably you do really want to avoid, and so that's the aminoglycosides, like genomycin and tobramycin. These things you're probably not likely to get. Actually, we'll give them to people if they have a life-threatening infection, but we'll give them to them in the hospital. T-lithromycin, another mycin, it's, uh, you're not supposed to take that, it's for respiratory infections. Um, some of the fluoroquinolones, these have um, the proprietary names, things like ciprofloxacin and levaquin, and these are commonly used antibiotics, and I prescribe them for myasthenics if they need them. I just warn them, I say, hey, if you get worse, if you're speech, swallowing, breathing, double, if you feel worse from a myasthenic standpoint, if you're starting this stuff, may be the cause for it. I think the vast majority of myasthenics can take most of those antibiotics without getting worse, but they just need to know that... Uh, Almost any antibiotic might throw them over the edge. And then be thoughtful about, about how to treat their infection. Don't use antibiotics if you don't need them. But if you need them, you can't not treat the patient. I mean, to be fair, almost every drug that a physician would prescribe has been reported by somebody to aggravate myasthenia at some point in time. So if you, if you take an absolute position where you're not going to use any drug in any myasthenic who... Uh, any drug that's ever been reported to cause problems, well, then you can't take pain medicine, you can't take muscle relaxers, you can't take any antibiotic, you can't take blood pressure medicine, you can't take statins for your cholesterol, you can't take gabapentin for your nerve, you can't take anything. So that you can't do that. That's not sensible. I think the main thing is to, to let patients know and their primary physicians know, if you start a new medicine, even something for high blood pressure, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. Just be aware that uh, if the myasthenic symptoms become worse, it could be from that drug, in which case may want to make a switch. And if you're not sure if it's worse, let me know. I'll be glad to see him and take a look at it and find out. But um, So, for example, if, if myasthenics wouldn't take statins for your cholesterol, then what are you going to do to control your cholesterol? There's uh, a limited number of other options. Statins are commonly used drug, and most myasthenics do well with them. But on occasion, people have their myasthenia declare itself when they start on a statin, then it gets better when they stop it. Or a, a known myasthenic gets worse when they start a statin for their cholesterol. And so it's just something to be aware of. We've had a couple of people with myasthenia take Botox, and um, it's, uh, it's not that it's life-threatening, but if you're getting Botox for something up in the forehead or wrinkles, it's... Um, uh, it's just going to make your myasthenic weakness worse in that area. So in general, we just, just, just don't take Botox. So that's the deal about medications. Um, there's another interesting concern that doctors and patients have, and it's, it's, uh, it makes sense that if you go back 30 years, there's a considerable literature that if you take IV contrast for an X-ray, like an IVP or a CT scan, uh, that this stuff can make your myasthenia worse. And I think that it's true. Um, but, but what is true is those reports were up until the early 80s, 1980s, and then they stopped. So for some reason, I mean, myasthenics kept getting intravenous contrast for CT scans and stuff like that, but, um, but, but the reports of adverse complications, those disappeared. It's kind of interesting. And so we actually just did a study at IU about... Uh, over the last couple of years, all the people with myasthenia gravis who were getting intravenous contrast for, for x-ray studies, um, I mean, there's so many of these patients that even if you say, we don't think they should get IV contrast, a bunch of them get it anyway because it's felt to be necessary. The person ordering the scan doesn't know they have myasthenia. Well, it turns out that um, 
doesn't look like there is an increased risk using the dye that's used now. It's a good example of where sometimes the things that, that change, it's not the patients, they're the same. It's not the doctors, they're the same. And it's not that the early reports were bad. The early reports were correct. What happened is they changed the IV contrast. <clears throat> they did it in the 80s. So the, the, uh, the stuff you get for an IVP or a CAT scan is not the same dye. It's much more benign. And it looks to me like it's really pretty safe to take that stuff. Uh, I, I, and uh, and I, th I think that's, um, uh, well, we're, we're going to present those data at uh, one of these upcoming meetings and, and maybe let myasthenics off the hook so they can actually get a better study if, if it's clinically necessary. And so uh, it turns, if you, mestinon works on cholinesterase to just block it so that you build up more acetylcholine. This EN101 prevents the body from making cholinesterase. They can't create it. It's been tested. Uh, it's just not a bromide. I mean, it doesn't anything like it. So it's, it's been tested um, fairly thoroughly in England and in Israel uh, in direct comparison with mestinon. And it turns out it works better, and it's got less side effects. EN101. E N101. Uh, so those are kind of interesting. There, there's actually there's another experimental drug that um, is has nothing to do with the immune system, but may make your symptoms a lot better. Um, it's being uh, tested. We're at our we're actually testing it in Lou Gehrig's disease, but there's a couple other centers testing it in myasthenia gravis. It's sort of an end run around all this stuff. It doesn't care about the immune system. It doesn't care about acetylcholine and and the, the neurotransmitter and receptors and cholinesterase, it says, well, who cares about that stuff? We know that that's where the weak link is in this disease. The nerve doesn't communicate with the muscle. That's the weak link. But, you know, all the actions in the muscle, the muscle has proteins that interact. So if you get a big calcium buildup in the muscle, the proteins interact and you get a squeeze, you get contraction. So maybe uh, we just need to work on that part of it, the muscle itself, and that's where this drug works. Um, it's called uh, tiraceptive. Um, I'll, I'll write it down and send it to you guys. It's an experimental drug, and it's being tested in Lou Gehrig's disease and myasthenia gravis. Uh, it's, um, it works on the muscle. got nothing to do with the immune system. And um, I think the more you read about it, the more excited you might get that it's uh, going to be something that makes your muscles stronger and that's really pretty safe. 